Hi, I'm Kristen Oaks-White. And I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Well, if you're an average American family of four, you spend about $1,048 a month on food. That's according to the United States Department of Agriculture's March Cost of Food Report. That comes out to about 9 to 12 percent of your average income, much less than what people in other countries pay. However, not much of your food dollar makes it to the farmer. In fact, according to the USDA, the amount going to the farmer hit a record low. On average, less than 15 cents of every dollar you spend on food makes it to the farmer. The total at the register goes up with every scan, but the part of each dollar spent on these items that makes it back to the farmer is at a record low, 14.8 cents. So let's take a dollar, break it into cents, and serve it up in a cup. So here I have that $1 worth of pennies in a little cup. We're gonna go around and ask some of you how many cents out of this cup actually makes it to the farmer. How much of this do you think actually goes to the farmer? Probably less than half. Less than half, how much do you think? 20%. 20%. It's actually at a record low. It's at 14.8%. So less than 15 cents out of this cup goes to the farmer. What do you think of that? Well, it doesn't seem right. <laughs> <laughs> not good, not good at all. 50 cents? It's a little lower. Uh, it's what is that, 30 cents? A little lower. Okay, 25 cents? <laughs> Little lower, it's actually at a record low right now. It's at 14.8 cents of every dollar goes to the farmer. What do you, what do you wow. think of that? Oh, that's not good. <laughs> I work for the Ag Center, so. Uh, you might have an advantage. So I might have an advantage, but I haven't looked recently. I'd say maybe, maybe out of a dollar, maybe about eight cents. Eight cents. You're actually low, it's 14.8. 14 14.8, 14 okay. 14.8 cents. So, uh, so what, what do you think about that? Oh, I don't think it's fair, but uh, you know that that's the way the agricultural system works. It seems until we recognize the value of what the farmers doing in the fields, and the, and uh, of course also the the fishermen and everyone that produces our food, um, we need to uh, recognize their their efforts in uh, in a more economically beneficial way, I guess. The money farmers get for this grain is one factor. It has not been economically beneficial, according to LSU Ag Center Ag Economist Kurt Guidry. Raw commodity prices have been, have been down for the last two or three years. Our major agriculture commodities are in a situation where we have somewhat of an oversupply domestically of those. And until we get that supply and demand situation in more balance, uh, commodity prices are likely going to remain, slow, remain low and therefore be a lower input cost in that food marketing chain. Speaking of marketing, that's where most of your food dollar goes, 85.2 cents on average. But that includes every step of processing in making your food. Anytime that commodity gets transformed, whether it be simply just moving it from point A to point B, uh, being processed, being having things added to it, it comes at a cost. And that cost uh, therefore increases the total, total amount that a consumer has to spend on that food dollar. There are some ways to ensure more of your food dollar goes to the farmer or rancher. One way is to buy directly from them. I know several ranchers who sell their beef directly to consumers, and they're really easy to find. I think you know a couple of them too, Kristen. Or you can always buy your fresh produce at the local farmer's market, and that gets more of your food dollars into the pockets of farmers. And it really is something that people should think of a little bit more because Every step along the way in which the food product, the commodity, is removed from the farmer, that's another step where the food dollar gets sliced up more and they get a lower percentage. But you also run into some areas that don't have, there are a lot of areas that don't have mm -hmm. farmer's markets or options. You know, you've got maybe one grocery store. Yeah, and but that's one cool thing that like uh, some of the groups like Breda here in the mm -hmm. Baton Rouge area is doing. They are taking the farmers markets on the road and bringing them into those food deserts like Scotlandville just outside of Baton Rouge. Right. There are lots of the same things going on in New Orleans. I know they got hit with Holly Grove shutting down, but mm -hmm. there are ways and people are actually trying to work so that the fa the fa if you can't come to the farms, they're trying to bring the farms to you. We can bring it to my hometown. <laughs>
Well, moving on, another thing that's hitting farmers' pocketbooks is the threat of Chinese trade tariffs. Although some of the talk has cooled off lately, it's still shadowing the markets. Sh uh, shadowing us right now is Twyla's Neil Malasson. Neil, I understand that it stopped some shipments mid-ocean. Yeah, in fact, it was 20 ships full of grain sorghum that got ch uh, ch their course changed uh, right as these Chinese tariffs were being announced. And it's kind of a worrying sign. The Chinese enacted these anti-dumping penalties on U.S. products, not just for sorghum, though, for other crops and grown in Louisiana, like soybeans, where planning is just now getting underway. Soybean seed is stacked to the ceiling at Olivier Farms in Arnoville here. They've been waiting for things to dry out after an unusually wet spring to plant, which is why they still have these 3,500 acres unplanted. Looming higher than these soybean seeds, however, is the threat of what lower prices may bring. Tariff does concern me for a long-term uh, price or price decrease because we're working on a very thin margin of profit on soybeans as it is. $10 is about what it takes just to uh, make us consider or be close to uh, being in a profit margin. And today I think soybeans are selling for 1030 something. So there's not a whole lot of profit margin to be made. If this tariff forces the price to drop, you know, 40 or 50 cents, it may put us uh, out of the black. So it's a big concern for us uh, long term. <laughs> Joey farms with his son Aaron, who's getting the equipment ready. He's focused on the task at hand because while he recognizes the harm tariffs might do, it's all still up in the air right now. There's already talks of, of subsidies that, that could come into play, which, you know, it, it, that might help in the long term. You know, maybe if, if, if things, these tariffs come into place and then the government actually enacts these subsidies to help us out, it might counteract, over, over counteract uh, the, the negatives. So. You know, obviously it could hurt, you know, it's just, it's hard to really know and see until it comes into play. While the Oliviers are waiting on things to dry out, their seed dealer, Dennis Markintel, pays them a visit. He said lower prices, whether from tariffs or from the huge supply of soybeans already out there, are a big threat to his business. Kind of early, uh, but if you give it another month or two, uh, the way the market, the commodity market could go down some more and uh, some of these uh, guys in south Louisiana could back off the uh, soybean acre. East of the Oliviers in Irwinville, Ray Sheck Snyder is checking on the 250 acres of beans he's already planted so far. He knows that many of these soybeans growing here will one day make their way to China, where the tariffs will hit them hardest. However, it's been an issue that growers like him have been working on since before the tariff issue even came up. Being that China is our biggest importer of uh, soybeans, it was kind of a big scare when it first got announced, thinking that they would retaliate. But um, I don't know if there's just that much uh, usage worldwide. That um, and and that's what kind of the United Soybean Board that I serve on. We are uh, starting to look into some of these countries that aren't such big users of beans and trying to get them to use more. We're still a ways off from both tariffs and the soybean harvest, but it's going to be something we're going to have to watch very closely. And guys, you know, it, it's, it's just always on the horizon, but we've had these razor-thin razor margins. One of the big causes of that is this huge amount of soybeans that are just overshadowing the market. And it's, uh, you know, that's as worrying to these guys, I think, as any threats of Chinese tariffs. I'll tell you, somebody I know who's watching it very closely. Landon White. Landon and Lynn White. Yes. They are very concerned about uh, the tariff and prices overall. Now, another thing I think I found interesting, I was talking to Ray Sheck Snyder, is these cool temperatures at night that we've had so far into uh, April here and into May even, it's worrying for them because Ray was telling me that a lot of times the soybean will actually start growing down because it's warmer uh, mm -hmm. underground than it is above mm. at, as they're seeding. And so what happens is you get these squirrely looking soybeans and it's often causes uh, mortality. Oh, wow. Them. Yeah. So it's just another, you know, it's just a weird season for these guys right now. It's been a weird couple of years. Thank you very much, Neil Malasson. Speaking of prices, we've been running down crawfish prices for most of the season this year, trying to find you the best bargains around the state. However, the cheapest crawfish ain't always the best crawfish. The one thing you should know is that there are three main grades of crawfish, select, 
field run, and peelers. Select are the biggest and the best crawfish that only, that's the only thing Kristen will buy. Yeah. I promise you. I'll buy they're what the I can ones, find. Yeah, they're the ones most consumers want at crawfish boils. Sometimes you'll hear about a premium grade, which is all large crawfish, but with Select, this is generally the best out there. It's also generally the most expensive. Field run crawfish are just crawfish that are bagged as they are caught. What you see is what you get. And peelers, as we all know, May those are the teeny tiny ones, the smaller <laughs> crawfish, and they're usually used to be frozen for later in the season, and I know some folks who use them as bait, good fishing bait. Interesting. So with that being said, if you go to an area and you find them more expensive than normal, check to see what grade they are. For instance, I know at Tony's they generally are serving select grade to consumers, and so they tend to be a little bit more expensive. Knowing these grades are what separates a savvy crawfish buyer from an average one. With that said, let's take a look at some prices from around the state. At Tony's right now, you can get them for $3.29 per pound boiled and live are running about $2.19 per pound. Yeah, Tony's is a staple in North Baton Rouge. At Swamp Daddy's in Alexandria, we found a big disparity. $5.29 per pound for boiled crawfish and only $1.69 a pound for live. And over at the Crawfish Tub in Crowley, you can find them for $3.50 a pound boiled, while live will only set you back about $1.50. Now we've talked a lot about prices for farmers, and I'll let you in on a little secret. It's not really a secret, but it works with all farm products, especially crawfish. You'll always get the best price and best quality by getting them directly from the farmer who raised them. Also the farmer will get the best price for that product that way and that will keep them in business for all of us to enjoy and the best way to absolutely find every crawfisherman who sells directly to customers is to go to our website twilighttv.org we'll link you to crawfish.org and there's a full list right there. Good to know. It's the first thing I'm going to look at when we get done. Oh, according to the latest LSU Ag Summary, the total gross farm income in Louisiana from beef cattle was estimated at $427 million. That is based on the 2016 numbers. This week, Twilight's Carl Wiggers takes us to Natchitoches, Louisiana to see how cattle are sold in the digital age. Usually, this sound is coming from a sale barn full of cattle but this isn't a normal livestock auction. At the Natchitoches Convention Center, this sale barn is full of monitors, and on those monitors are more than 4,500 head of calves, feeder cattle, and breeding stock. Many of those are from customers of Superior Livestock Regional Representative Rayburn Smith. We move around to the areas where, or the regions where all the cattle are moving at that time, and this, this has got to be a really good sale. Lots of Louisiana Southern cattle featured. And so the Superior decided to come down and do the sale kind of for us, you know, for the Gulf Coast people. But all these guys that are here are not buyers. They're buyers and sellers as well. One of those selling customers is Point Capi cattleman John Grizzaffi. This is only the third year it's been in Natchitoches, but I've been doing business with Raven Smith and Superior Livestock for th 30 years now. It's here that Grizzaffi can interact with the people that are buying his cattle, and he can learn exactly what they are looking for in that next lot. You learn a lot. Uh, what the market is, is, is demanding, you know, as far as the quality. Uh, we've come a long ways, you know, in, in using the genetics that we are using these days and, and uh, trying to meet uh, the demand that, that these, these uh, feeders and packers are asking us to, to develop. According to Smith, this kind of sale offers his customers a totally different opportunity than the traditional sale barns that have been used for decades. We actually operate a barn too, a sale barn, Red River Livestock and they come in one at a time or 10 at a time, you know, and we sell them as individuals. We're selling truckload lots here. But it's uh, just another good marketing tool that has come along and, and, uh, and it's been beneficial. From Natchitoches, Louisiana, I'm Carl Wiggers with This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. This is the third year that Natchitoches hosts this event to learn how you can sell your cattle on Superior Livestock. At a sale like this, head over to our website at twilighttv.org. Showing livestock teaches youth how to be the best of the best. It's not all about the shiny trophies, purple ribbons, or sparkling belt buckles, as Kristen well knows. That's a fact that I know all too well. I also know that it takes numerous hours in the barn, endless daily chores of feeding, washing, exercising, and plenty of blood, sweat, and tears to raise a champion animal. While not every individual will go home with a trophy in hand, every showman gains responsibility, sportsmanship, and self-confidence traits that will grow champions both in and out of the show ring. That's why the Louisiana Farm Bureau Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee hosts their annual Youth Livestock Show in Alexandria every year. 
Exhibitors from across the state paraded more than 180 head of cattle at the LSU Ag Center's DeWitt Livestock Arena. YFNR committee members say this event provides a great opportunity for young showmen to work with their animals, hone their skills, and gain confidence for future shows. My favorite moment from today, they had a little boy go in in a little purple shirt, and he, he was about this tall, and you could tell it was his first show, or it, maybe it wasn't his first show, but he looked fresh, and he looked so excited, and I just, we love seeing the babies go in. We love seeing the, the, new, the new ones, and we had one that uh, Dad went in the ring with her because this was her first show. So that's a cool experience for us to have to, to be her first show. Now, if you want to see all of the photos and winners from the wife and our livestock show, you can visit our website at twilighttv.org. And I'm glad you didn't get run over by a Brahmin cow. Oh, uh, that joke's <laughs> never going to die. It never will, neither will the video. Still to come on Twyla, we have some singing cowgirls from across the pond. But first, we may have a new contender for the best burger in Baton Rouge and an all new feasting on agriculture. Stay with us. <laughs> I hope they are. Find your place in the country and the lender who can get you there. Find Louisiana Land Bank. Financing for country homes, recreational property, farms and ranches, and agribusiness. Farming is my way of life. I chose this career, but farming chose me. A lot of people ask you what you do, and I tell them I'm a farmer. I'm a cattleman. I am a fisherman. I'm a scientist. I'm a steward of the land. I am a farm woman. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am a Farm Bureau. Feasting on Agriculture with A.J. Sabine is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. By the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board, think rice. And by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, beef, it's what's for dinner. Hey there folks, I'm A.J. Sabine and welcome to another tasty edition of Feasting on Agriculture. As you can see, we're here at Driftwood Cask and Barrel, located right here in downtown Baton Rouge. And this place combines all the things that I love. Craft cocktails, local brew, and of course, farm to table. Joining us now is Chef Sean Pooch Rivera, co-owner here at Driftwood Cask and Barrel. Sean, tell the folks about the concept here at this beautiful, beautiful building. Well, we, we uh, pride ourselves on staying local. We have over 70% of our uh, spirits and craft beer are locally produced in Louisiana. And we, uh, when possible, we try to use the sustainable farming uh, solutions here in Baton Rouge as far as our products that we use in the kitchen. Why did you guys decide to go farm to table and keep everything local here in Louisiana? We thought that Baton Rouge needed to uh, kind of step up to the times, I would say, and uh, we wanted to be the pioneers. You know, people go to Lafayette, people go to New Orleans to try new things, and we wanted to be the ones to do it here in Baton Rouge first. Awesome, and speaking of stepping up, what are we stepping into today? Today we have a uh, Iverstein Farm burger patty, the, we have a T. Moy's Farm bacon jam, and we have a house-made pimento cheese to all create a off-the-menu item called the Bad Mama Jam. Named after me. Let's go get in the kitchen. Let's do it. All right, right now we're in Sean Booch Rivera's kitchen here at Driftwood Cask and Barrel. 
Oh, we're underneath the hood. That's why it sounds like a jet is taking off. Sean, take it away. Today, we're going to showcase some Louisiana grass-fed beef from Iverstein Farms. We love to use local. We love to work with local. It's a beautiful, beautiful beef that was fresh ground yesterday. Tell us why you chose to go with Iverstein Farms. Iverstein is somebody who's been dedicated to Baton Rouge and really showcasing local, sustainable farming. And I mean, at the end of the day, like, no, Baton Rouge is not going to be able to be the next level of a culinary destination unless we support people who are willing to support the chefs and support local culinary. I'm actually just going to start with some salt and pepper. That's all you need to do. There's no reason to go ahead and do anything other than that. The beef speaks for itself. It's an 80-20 blend, short rib, sirloin, and chuck. One of the things we like to do here at Driftwood is do things off the menu. We use some Timois Farms out of Sunset, Louisiana. We use their bacon. We make a bacon jam, and we make our own pimento cheese here. So. Uh, it's pimento cheese, bacon jam, and some Iverstein Farms beef. Man, I cannot wait to taste this bad mamba jamma. Because if it's anything like this bad mamba jamma, I know it's going to be just as fine as he can be. That's right. <laughs> Tell me about this enterprise that you got, you and Matt have created, the Driftwood Cask and Barrel. Uh, not just Matt, uh, this is partner Carla Carly. Um, Matt and I, we, we, we came together kind of a dream team scenario. We have some investors that came to us. They knew that we were all uh, you know, aspiring to be the best in our crafts, whether it be craft beer, craft cocktail, or food. And uh, we came together to start Drip with Cask and Barrel. It kind of pioneered some different things in, in Baton Rouge and downtown Baton Rouge and bring a good presence to Dr. State Capital. What kind of bun are you going to put with this uh, hamburger? We are using a brioche bun. Brioche, is that Spanish? Brioche, is that French? You're... What the? So how much longer you got on this? That, honestly, we can pull off right now. All right, let folks. It rest for, rest, if we let it rest right now, it'll get to about medium, rare, medium. OK, go ahead, do, work your magic, bro. All right, folks. Sean Pooch Rivera here at Driftwood Cask and Barrel has made his bad mamma jamma. When we get back, we get to taste this tasty, tasty burger. Stick around. We'll be right back. This is the moment I knew. His future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Thank you so much for sticking around, folks. Again, the wonderful and amazing Sean Pooch Rivera, co-owner, manager, all-around good guy here at Driftwood Cask and Barrel down on 3rd Street here in Baton Rouge. This is the Bad Mama Jamma. Tell folks what's on this hamburger in case they missed it. This is some uh, Iverstein 8020 ground chuck 
uh, sirloin and short rib, some house made pimento cheese, T Moy's Farms, uh, bacon jam, and a brioche bun. Very simple yet bold as hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at this beautiful, beautiful hamburger. And uh, cocktail specials. We have a great happy hour. We're open till 2 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. Mm. And we would love for you to come and see us, please. Thank you. Mm. Oh, pretty fire, huh? Folks, if you, I want a, an answer to the age old question where's the beef? It's right here at Driftwood Casting Barrels. That is amazing. Thank you, sir. Folks at home or wherever you are, if you're on your mobile device, if you guys want information about Driftwood Casting Barrel, Louisiana beef, you can always go to our website at twilighttv.org. Now, while I've had some of this wonderful, remarkable bad man pajama, I've got to taste this fashionable. Oh, nibbler. Pinky up. Mm. Pinky up. Sir. Mm. Pinky up? Yeah, you're That's right about good. that. That's, you're right about that. Mm. Man, you can't get full here at Driftwood. Something's wrong with you. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Sean Puchero. Mi hermano. Mi hermano. Muchas gracias. Uh, what a wonderful time. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. That's all from Driftwood Cask and Barrel. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Feasting on Agriculture with A.J. Sabine was brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. By the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board, think rice. And by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, beef, it's what's for dinner. Before we close out the show this week, we're going to send you off with our very first Twyla Boost. And Avery, you know mm -hmm. how much I love the Today Show. Yes, yes. So this was kind of boosted from them. Yeah, and one of my <laughs> favorite anchors has Hoda has the morning boost. So I thought let's do mm -hmm. an ag version of it and send you off into your week with a great uplifting ag video. So oh, that's what we're doing. And at the end of each Twyla episode, we'll show you our favorite ag themed viral video to leave you with a smile and hopefully give you a little boost to start your week. So our first Twyla boost comes from three young Irish farmers. As the old saying goes, you work hard, you play hard, and the three girls in this video appear to have taken that phrase quite literally. The farming news site Agriland posted this video of the three girls belting out the feel good classic Don't Stop Believing by Journey and their infectious singing and dancing won't fail to bring a smile to your face. The clip has racked up more than 13 million views on Facebook as of today and once you watch it, you'll see what all the fuss is about. Now that's going to be stuck in my head. To watch the entire video, head over to our website twilighttv.org where we'll post a link for you to watch it. Great song. Actually, don't stop believing. First song I ever learned low lyrics to. And they did a pretty good job of it mm -hmm. too, I must yeah. say. Yeah, they sounded good. <laughs> well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we'll show you why young people are going to advocate at the Louisiana State Capitol. I see what you did there, advocate. Until then, you can watch all our stories online at twilatv.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. For all of us here at Twyla, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week. Mm -hmm.